Thank you. Um, Mr. Isaacman, I wanted to ask you, so let's just um, pretend you're in Missouri uh, among a group of students, constituents, just a good cross section of, 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 a, of my state. If you were to, to answer the question, why is it important that the United States of America gets to the moon first or gets to Mars first ahead of the, the Chinese, what would, what would be your answer? Well, Senator, I think there's a couple reasons, one of which uh, is fulfilling a promise that's been made by every president since 1989 and over $100 billion that's been uh, funded by taxpayers on our grand return to the moon. I think uh, it's imperative that we do so, and failing to do so calls into question uh, American exceptionalism beyond just our expertise in the high ground of space. Uh, second, I do believe, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that when we return, we will have an opportunity uh, to determine and realize the scientific, economic, and national security value uh, on the lunar surface. Now, an example I used in my, uh, you know, my previous hearing is that there is helium-3 on the moon. Not a lot of it, but certainly more than there is here on Earth, and that uh, is predicted to be a more efficient source uh, of fusion power. Now, I mean, our foreign policy and wars have been fought for a century over sources of uh, power. To get that wrong could have implications here on Earth that could change the balance of power. Um, we have in this country, I think, a, a pretty robust ecosystem of, of um, new companies, small businesses, sort of disruptors that have entered the fray here as it relates to whether it's commercial space uh, exploration or, or travel or what have you. How can NASA in your role help sort of cultivate that, work with them? Because I do think that's one of the advantages we have over China in this race. What can you do as in, in this potential, this new role? Uh, Senator, it's a great question, and um, you know a lot of people do believe generally these are, you know, these are new developments. But in you know in reality, going back to the 1960s in the space race, uh, NASA worked alongside some of our great aerospace companies. I mean, you know, whether it was Boeing or McDonald, McDonald Douglas, Douglas and Northrop, for sure, uh, sir. So a lot of those names are are still very relevant within the space program today. And then there's also a lot of new names that is you know referred to sometimes as new space or commercial space. I think it's gonna take you know, the contributions of the many to do the near impossible. Now, uh, where NASA can play a role is consistent in the past, which is sharing its expertise and talent to help these new uh, companies. When NASA does tend to figure out the near impossible and it's mature enough technology to hand it off to industry where innovation can improve upon the capability and lower cost, that's a, that's a great outcome. I also think NASA can do a very good job expressing the need. What is the requirement? Because there are, Lots and lots of commercial space companies now. I think uh, Ranking Member Cantwell mentioned, I think she said over a thousand in her state alone. That's fantastic. We just want to make sure they're all working on things that bubble up to our most important objectives. So I think NASA can do an even better job of working with industry to outline the problems that need to be solved and ensure we're kind of concentrating American ingenuity in the right direction, sir. Well, I think that um, to put on the parochial hat for a moment, I think St. Louis is a defense tech uh, with all with former McDonnell Douglas and Boeing with their defense side, the NGA, NGA West, which is completing their new facilities, a lot of opportunities, um, and which leads sort of the next question on quantum. Washington University in St. Louis is doing a lot of really important work here. How, how do you see NASA's role uh, in furthering that mission, right, to, to be on the cutting edge? Because I think what, what I was getting at with the first question, all of this, um, civilizations come and go, right? And in many ways, whoever has the most advanced technology, whether it's warfare or on the more of the commercial side, they tend to thrive and win out, win this great competition. And NASA is going to play a, and is playing a very important role, continue to play an important role. How do you see on the quantum side NASA working with with research institutions and the private sector? Uh, it's an excellent, uh, excellent question, Senator. So, thank you, um, by the way. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I uh, I mentioned earlier um, uh, about the importance of determining the, the orbital economy. So for 60 years, other than a few exceptions, uh, the space economy has still come down to launch observation and communication, which is largely funded by the government. And if we do want a very exciting spacefaring civilization in the future with lots of space stations and orbital, you know, lunar outposts and Mars, Mars bases, we're going to actually have to figure out that economy. There's a lot of prospect when it comes to quantum computing, quantum communications. And, and what I would like to do is ensure that the highest potential science and research has a expeditious path 
to the International Space Station so we can maximize that remaining life and then hopefully crack the code on the orbital economy that gives all the commercial space stations a fighting chance. So quantum has a number of applications that can take advantage of the unique environment of microgravity, sir. Well, thank you um, for your service, and uh, I wish you all the best in this new position. Good luck. Yep.